before I start going down the digital humanities road, I'm trying to get a sense of the audience, and I think I should say I love books, I write books, and I read books, okay? Because <laughs> it, it could be, Gerhardt's heard me say this before, and Nicholas has too, it, you might perceive some of the things I have to say as unkind to print, but w w I'll come to that. Also, another confession is I'm not a, I'm not a historian, I'm a Germanist like um, Gerhardt is, so, but I do do, tech, you know, I've written widely on the railway in Germany, computer and its network, most recently nanotechnology. In terms of digital humanities, though, I have a project right now called Mapping the Literary, ra ra literary Railway in Germany. And just to give you an idea of how big these projects are. Like what these guys are talking about, for those of you who aren't familiar, these are massive, massive things. Last summer I put in a, for a funding request to get this uh, Mapping the Literary Railway with, with my research assistants. And we started off with 19th century German literature, right? And, and that just, it, it was, that's an insane amount of stuff to do. So then we thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll narrow it down to Fontana. Uh, Theodor Fontana, as Gerhard suggests, he's sort of the Dickens of Berlin. And then, and then it came down to Effie Briest. That's all we got done. <laughs> we mapped the railway in Effie Briest. And that is nothing compared to what these guys are doing. But, so in my small corner of academia, my, 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 my sympathies have always been with those who, those who um, study how these peculiar objects we call technology are constructed and how their complex meanings are negotiated amongst the many factions who seek to control them, but also more importantly seek not to be controlled by such developments. And that's one of the fundamental tensions that we deal with in, in, in digital humanities. We don't want our fields and our research to be controlled by devices. Now I know, um, did we send John's article around already, Heiko? Uh, Fun Via's article, does everybody have that? I'm gonna, he's not here, he had to uh, cancel out yesterday, but I'm gonna refer to this paper a little bit, not that you'll have a chance to read it, but it, um, John alludes to these tensions between people who do digital humanities and those who are not inclined. Um, and, and there can be a, a good deal of pushback from colleagues who, who don't understand it or, or are not inclined to, to do these sorts of things as, as Gerhardt laid out um, quite, quite well. But the difficulty is we live inescapably, ineluctably, whichever word you'd like to choose, at the threshold of a relatively new and for some unsettling age. And, and, it's, and, and a discussion of this new age is unavoidable in the humanities. And, and it's sort of the basis, it underlies the discussion um, uh, that we're taking up in part today on this panel. I, I think in part it's time to reimagine the scholarly enterprise in terms of this new age. And that's what we're seeing being done here with the Blumenbach, Haeckel, and Darwin sites. What, what they're doing is they're implementing practices and processes that will allow the institution of higher education, and I think more specifically humanities research, um, to, to reemerge re in, in, in a form that goes beyond the so-called information revolution without compromising our mission as conservators of, of the best of whatever this brawling, struggling thing we call humanities is or may yet be. But you really can't be living in 2015 without sensing that these infinitely serviceable methods of representation that have worked so well for so long are beginning to falter. I think Nell was sort of getting to that point with her discussion of the book, and, I, and I'll take some time at the end to address some of the questions that people brought up as well. Um, and, and these projects are among the leading edge of academics who are developing new ways to convey our work to peers, students, and the public at large. And that's another the discussion we should probably have. Uh, John von Weyer talks about his public role quite explicitly in Darwin mm -hmm. Online, and Gerhardt refers to these projects as Bildungsprojekte, um, but you're out, you're out there for the public anyway. It's, there's no way you can help that given, the, given what, we're, what, what we're doing. Um, and, and I should say leading edge of a, of, a, of, a, of a recent wave of these projects. I mean, these types of projects have been around for a while. The Perseus projects at Tufts has been around since 1985. That's the real front edge, but now there seems to be more and more. Um, and, and I think it's important to point out also that what these types of projects are doing is not, not replacing traditional humanities research, but, it, but bolstering it, right? It, it, they, uh, they, they give us more opportunities. Um, they add to our sort of, our, our bevy of tools that we have as humanities researchers. But the fact is we don't really anymore live in an age in which information conserves itself primarily in these textual objects called books, right? I'm not declaring by any means the death of the book. I admire um, Roman's uh, dual publication strategy, as he calls it, that'll include at least a portion of this massive Haeckel letter to be published um, in, in print. But we're really now in a world in which information, not only information, but also meaning, 
is really struggling to escape its kind of customary channels. Think, for example, about libraries, as Herr Rolfing was talking about. The, libraries used to be, and they still are to some degree, as our guest from Pennsylvania Dutch country reminds us, um, they were bowls of information, right? And those bowls were only accessible by those privileged few, right? In the, in the US, we call these library privileges. So quite explicitly, it's a privilege. Um, libraries now are, are, are virtual sieves for information. They're, they're designed to positively leak information. And I think one of the best ways to deal with this escaping information and to serve the, the scholarly muse is to alter the channels that have served us so well in the age of the scriptorium and the inescapable facticity of data. Just let this stuff leak. And that's what each of these projects is doing. What they're doing is they're altering channels, they're opening up information, and it's leaking out in a way that needs to happen. So digital humanities is really, it's a, it's a recognition that the digital turn that I'm alluding to is, is really here to stay. And that the text and the images that we analyze and we interpret and we critique are no longer delivered fixed and bound, solely delivered fixed and bound on the pages of a book and then shelved in a library. John in, um, in his paper refers to Darwin Online quite appropriately as a game changer. And I, I would add that his and all of these projects are game changers in an already changed game. We're just coming around to this and the humanities recognizing that the game has changed. And it really has very much. Um, what these sites do is leverage the digital turn and the tools that have made these projects available, right? So again, they're on the leading edge of this sort of wave that I'm talking about. And so, so the objects of our study are more and more going to be delivered, as I said, on a digital platform. And what this means, as you can see from, from all of these sites, but I think also from what Gerhard does really well, is, is it, it means that the images and the text are then malleable. Think Photoshop, think data mining, think all of this hyperlinking and so forth between objects and, and text. And the unfixed and dynamic nature of that text and those images allows us to do exciting things. So in the Haeckel project, Roman, identi sorry, Roman identifies um, network analysis among authors, places, and themes. And there are even other ways of visualizing those networks that he had up there earlier that can possibly lead to other research questions, could drive other research questions. Um, Heiko and Gerhardt are linking the material object with the text in an informative way. That's kind of a nice anticipation of this Internet 2.0 or the Internet of Things that we keep reading about that's on the way. That's a very interesting aspect of this. Um, Heiko also imagines future algorithms that performed analytical procedures on texts and then automatically extract information based on quantitative analysis and even artificial intelligence. And Gerhardt emphatically demonstrates, although he threw a lot of math at us, I wasn't comfortable with all the math, but, but he emphatically demonstrates that these sites are excellent jumping off points for further digital humanities research, anything from engrams to, to, to sentiment analysis to topic modeling. So, so you got a nice overview of some of the things that, that, are, that, that can happen with sites like this. And, and P.S., we're going to, on the one hand, there's two hands to my P.S. So on the one hand, we are going to eventually stop fetishizing the digital. And this is just going to be called humanities, right? Because saying digital humanities would be like having called traditional humanities the book humanities. We don't do that, right? The books, and it's a technology in and of itself. It's going to go away. This is going to be just a natural part of what we do. On the other hand, this is the second hand of my postscript. On the other hand, we're going to stop reading, as we saw in John's paper, about denigrating comments like these three projects as being just scanning work. Um, wow, that's, a breath that's breathtaking. Um, the idea that projects like these are somehow lightweight in a, in, a, in a more serious print world is just plain ignorant as in oblivious to the actual world around you. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible some of the things that John encountered, as you'll read in his article when you get a chance. <clears throat> now, another question that I always encounter out there for these types of projects is just where they fit in the glam world. Now, I, I know all my colleagues here are very glamorous, but by glam, I mean galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Like, how do they fit into that? Um, I noticed, for example, that none of them, thankfully, fall into the trap of calling their projects an archive. Because if you do that, you really piss off archivists. Because that's their job, and it's a field, and there are certain standards and so forth. But archive, archivists are greatly vexed by the digital world, right? Because in the IT world, 
to archive something is to take it offline and make it inaccessible, right? We've, we've sort of perverted the, the meaning. It also has to do, in the IT world, archiving has to do with copying and copyability. So archiving is it, coterminous, actually, then with redundancy and duplication. Ouch, that doesn't sound good for archi archivists. Don't like that. And, 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 but because they're into, of course, unique records of enduring value, as are all of these projects. But we all know that once something has been digitized, it's, it's, it's no longer unique, right? So what we're witnessing, and this could be a topic of discussion for another day, but Gerhard has alluded to it in terms of intellectual property, we're, we're witnessing the shift in the value of the original as a one of a kind, and that holding the great value, to the value lying in something's copyability. That, that's a huge shift that I, th I think we're starting to see occur, and we'll see more and more in terms of um, intellectual property. So anyway, what, what are these guys if they're not, they're not archives? And they're not archives. John uh, refers to Darwin Online as an online catalog that links to the material it records. Uh, Roman, at one point, calls Haeckel Correspondence an online data bank. Uh, Heiko and Gerhard are bo both refer to Blumenbach Online as a digital edition, in part. <clears throat> and that's all good. I think that's fantastic. Let's just stick with the various names, because all of these projects are different from one another, and they're also very different than what's going on in the galleries, libraries, archives, and, well, not very different, they're different enough from what's going on in those worlds. And that, and that fact is actually very nicely illustrated by Heiko when he highlights the, meta, the standards and metadata, metadata differences within the GLAM world and how they had to develop and, and wrestle with metadata for this particular project. And what these projects really are is part of the digital humanities world, right? And, and, and that's a new place that's fighting for an identity. And I think one of the difficulties with the identity of digital humanities is that it always involves projects like these, and all these projects are so extraordinarily interdisciplinary, they don't follow certain certain rules, and, and that, that could be difficult for, for, for people. So I'll close these prepared comments with <coughs> an interesting study that I found conducted by the Finnish Institute just recently in 2014 about digital humanities and future preservation projects, and that's not a perfect fit. That title is not perfect fit with what everybody's doing, but I think the findings are strikingly appropriate for what we're talking about today. So they asked interviewees um, what they thought would be the best and the worst scenarios, so the utopia and dystopia, for digital preservation and digital humanities in the year 2030. And, and you know, sort of the executive summary is that there seems to be a clear drive for open knowledge, but that clear drive for open knowledge has its challenges. So here's what the best case scenario includes. The best case is everything, and by that, by that I mean, I think they assume the, the cultural record in its entirety, everything, is digitized and available online free with a solid infrastructure. Utopia is what I'm talking about. Uh, everything is properly linked with metadata. Everything is theorized properly and rights are clearly given and attributed, right? So mass digitization and online availability of properly consulted, publicly funded collections was mentioned as the best case scenario by almost every single respondent. And all of these projects, Haeckel, Boomenbach, and Darwin, fit the best case scenario. They've got an effective online infrastructure that's open to the public, which we've, which we've already talked about, which public uses it. The metadata have been well thought out, if not standardized. Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the respondents mean by properly theorized, but the Blumenbach, Haeckel, and Darwin projects are indeed theorized, uh, thereby ri rising way above the level of mere scanning projects that, that I, I already mentioned to. Now, they also, the interviewees, acknowledge that in reality, there's never enough resources to digitize all cultural heritage, right? Duh. Um, so here's the dystopia. Worst case scenario, number one, archives are overwhelmed and outpaced by the, by the technological change. I'm sure everybody here, can, everybody who's working on these projects can relate to that already. It's very difficult to keep up. Number two, the digital black hole. So there's lost information in the change beginning from the 1990s. This, of course, refers to born digital material, but there's also the problem with projects that don't make it. And by that, I mean don't get funded, right? If we can't fund, for example, Max Eit online, does anybody know who Max Eit is? See? Does he go further into rail? He wrote great railway literature around, around 1800. It's wonderful. 1800, around 1900. Um, uh, does he fall further into relevance? So there's a worry over culture that's up close and culture that's far away, and how do we choose? Um, number three, I think, 
or C, I don't know, I don't have it numbered. Uh, physical collections become neglected and under-resourced as emphasis shifts to the digital, so they become major catalog, ba uncatalogued backlogs. Thus, my respect for Roman's dual publication strategy, I think it's important to pursue both. Uh, number four, private companies own the data. That would be the dystopia, to which I would add that this already, already politically fraught decision of which projects to fund would be further corrupted by the commercial influence. And it's crazy to think about how bad an idea that is, a, 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 and yet, Google, right? What, what do you do about, you better, at this point, we better just hope Google's a good guy. <laughs> Seriously, because there's, there's no way to stop that. You, 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 that's an excellent point. You know, they came in, they started one in the library, they were just looking for mass numbers. They weren't looking at the accuracy and so forth that these folks are looking at and Blumenbach and the other things. And, and, and that's gonna be problematic. The other thing would be everything behind paywalls, JSTOR and some of these other things. I can't remember, somebody mentioned another one. Yeah. Uh, which is sort of anathema to the democratic impulse of this digital turn. Uh, and then finally, this one I had to chuckle at, they were worried that a poor economic situation would mean not enough resources for humanities and social science research, to which I would say, duh, that's always the case, right? <laughs> Analog or digital, it doesn't matter. But bottom line is I think we're well on our way to opening up knowledge in a manner that we've not seen before, but we, we, we've got to keep our eyes on that dystopia. I mean, I, I, I think that, I don't know what you do about Google. Maybe we could talk about Google because it's, it's very problematic. But nothing will shut down these information sieves quicker or more quickly than fights over money and politics, right? The change that's afoot is largely a positive one, and we've got to keep it going by remaining vigilant to the dystopias, but we've also got to find excellence within the budding network that projects like these represent. Um, my, that's it for my talk, for my remarks, as I was told to limit it to about 15 minutes, but I went faster because I want to talk a little bit about some of the questions that people brought up. I think that, you know, the, the, the point that Nell was bringing, you, you were getting there, you were alluding to your book, right, and you wrote it in 2010 and it's fairly new, but there's a sense, what, what happens, for example, let's say Youngman is the top Grota scholar in the world, right, and he writes this great, let, let's just say it's a book. He writes a great book where he makes points A, B, and C, and they're all brand new thoughts about Grota. That's even funnier. Um, <laughs> but it turns out C is wrong. A and B were right, groundbreaking, wonderful. C is wrong. So, so in the print world, how long does it take before C gets corrected? Oh my gosh, a long time. If you think it through before, somebody starts writing articles on Youngman's book and then they start pointing out the mistakes and how long does it take to turn an article around, let alone how long does it take a book? It could be 10 years, C is out there and because Youngman said it, it's a fact, right? Changing, changing things in the, in, the, in the print age is like turning a barge around in a river, right? It's very slow. Changing things in the, in the digital age to become less wrong, because I think that's what we, we're all trying to do. Gerhard alluded to that, being enlightenment. We all set out what we think is right, hoping that somebody's interested in it, and maybe they'll come around and prove us wrong. To become less wrong is a much quicker process in the, in the, in the, in the digital age, right? You could just like turn a motorboat around in a river. People can find it, and, they, and, then it can, and then the record can be corrected. I think that's an interesting thing that we're dealing with, because that can also, lead to two hasty conclusions as well, as we know from sort of 24-hour news channels. What else did I want to say? The difference between now and the 80s, I think, you know, when you were talking about data and so forth, Martin, I think that, um, statistics, excuse me. I, I, the statistics aren't gonna change, right? But I, I do think that the tools available now to humanities researchers are, are phenomenal. The, the question is, and I, and I think this is an open question, what do we ask of the humanities researchers? Now, Gerhard suggests humanities folks need to um, know statistics. Uh, some people will say humanities folks need to know how to write code. I, I don't know. I mean, do humanities folks right now need to know how to assemble a book and bind it and so forth? I mean, I, it's just a question of, how far into the structure of your technology do you, need to, do you need to go? Because then on the other hand, it's simply, I take this tool at face value, I have no idea what's behind it, I apply my text to it, and, and, and there it is. Um, and I think another difference is um, visualization. I think that there are such incredibly helpful ways to visualize statistics and data now that I, I think, you don't agree? No, go ahead. Well, you can respond. Well, the, the problem with the statistics, as far as I can, can follow it, 
is that these are models. It's, the, 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 the problem is biggest in economics. What you do is a sort of mathematical model, which is based on presumptions of what philosophical presumptions, on what correlation actually means, or even worse, on what causality means. Right. The difference between the 80s and the noughties or our days is that if you wanted to do this in the 80s, you had to know how it is. That's worked. right. That's right. You had to know that in path analysis, you couldn't take the variable and the explanatory factors into the equation if the two actually correlated anyway. It had to be independent. You had to know what independent means. Right. What independence means. So you had to know an awful lot about notions of causality. And what you actually now see in the debate about how we in the social sciences and economics went dramatically wrong there, and they do know the mathematical modeling. If you were a decent uh, economist, you have to know this these days. You have to be a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Where it goes dramatically wrong now is because it's so easy for all of us to do this, we don't have to do the, the, uh, That's right. the, the calculations anymore. In the 1980s, you sat with SPSS, yeah. right? it still right. exists, right. and you had to do all the work. Yes. And now, what you do is... Do any flashbacks to a dread? Somebody <laughs> applied that to Kafka, and I, I, I just... <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. You throw in all the, all the data, and you get chuck, cluster analysis. You know, it took me days to do a cluster analysis right. in the 1980s as a student. No, you do it in 10 seconds. That's true. But what you don't have at the moment, and I think that's the problem, it's not learning statistics. Learning statistics is pretty easy these days. What you do with all this kind of stuff is built in philosophical presumptions, that is which a are rarely discussed. And the very few people, that may be less in the humanities because we don't like to talk about causality anyway, <laughs> but in the, in the social sciences, this is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. If you've been dean of the social science department for, for, for many years, if you look at the research going on over there, making presumptions on the basic or statistical analysis, where every little idiot who had a little bit of knowledge about <coughs> philosophy or science could say, well, this simply doesn't work because you're causal factors mm -hmm. and what is the, the cause and the effect are actually related from the beginning. It's the, the simplest. Yeah. My teacher of causality actually always used to say, look, it starts with the wood, the forest, the, the trees and the deer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, where's the causality over there? Right, <laughs> 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 And you, I think there it's where it's, where it's um, naive at the moment. But yeah, and, it, that, and that's the question, you know, I think what, what how, how, behind, how much behind the magic curtain do, the, do they need to go? Do they, do, you know, if, for example, I think with coding, that's another thing, you know, that's the big debate. When you say that the discussions aren't being had, the debate, I've not, never heard the discussion about statistics before. This is the first time. But the discussion about coding is a heated conversation in the field because of vision because 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 the Because formalization. Formalization right. means selecting the world in an orderly way, mm -hmm. leaving out the parts you don't select. Right. So if you do formalization, you do you say you open up knowledge. No, you open up certain perspectives of the world. You don't open up objective or impartial knowledge. Your whole process of codification and formalization is one of selection, which isn't just a naive selection. It's guided by the tradition of where you come from, Kuhn, Gardner, whatever you want to put in right. All applies to that. And that, I think, is in the enthusiasm, as you would put it. Um, yeah, I mean that way I also do it. Uh, in the enthusiasm of the Methodists of digital humanities, that's a bit lost. Because all the tools are so wonderfully easy to use these days. So that's a bit where I'm, yeah. I'm also skeptical about visuality. Because there I think... There are definitely some. There are now visualization for humanities. You know, there are yeah. people who... In Stanford. That, look, if you, you know, I do visual work, I work on visual stuff myself. Look at the skull we looked at from Blumenbach, the one that was turning around. Mm. Somebody selected the angle. No question. Somebody selected the mise-en-scene. Well, they put it on a, what was supposed to be a neutral background. Right? We didn't put it against black or red or green. We put it against some, some white stuff. 
So you choose the angle, you choose the mise en scène, and you choose the colors. And the colors are the, most of the stuff for my own research on Rembrandt, I actually can't use what is available online because I don't know how they did the colors. So I have to go back to the original painting, to the real material object, in fact. Because most of the pictures that are available, the images that are available online, are not trustworthy. To, to that Apart from the fact that color is, is in the subject. <laughs> well, but to, I, mean, I would add to that, so then you wanted to write about a Rembrandt painting, you had to choose your words, right? Just like they chose the background. I mean, I, I think that there's no way to pull the, there's no way to pull that sort of meta aspect of it out of it, no matter what the type of research is. For a second, um, I, I, I want to make a slight distinction between, it's not really a distinction. These are digital, these would be considered digital humanities projects, obviously. But that's one level of it. Then, then what we do with this is another. I can do perfectly tr tr traditional research with these archives, right? With these collections. I can do traditional research, but then because of the way they're encoded and the way that if they're marked up, I can do some of the type of techniques that, that Gerhard was talking about. And the last thing I wanted to say, and, and, and I'm, I'm running over is to the, our friend with, from the Pennsylvania Dutch country, um, and I said this to everybody, academia.edu, fight the power. Just put your, get, sign up on academia.edu, put your stuff on academia.edu, it's wide open. You might get a nasty letter occasionally, I've gotten letters before, but, so I take that one down, but I, I put everything up on academia.edu because it's about opening up this information. Sorry, was that too long?